Uh, this is Justin Stevens, um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in today for this. Um, we are here to, to talk about our real-world comparison between pedestrians and BizBlock and our field measurements. So just a quick uh, agenda. We'll go through introductions, who we are, uh, give a quick project overview, some of our base assumptions, uh, where and what kind of data we collected as part of uh, the first game of the season, look at how our data compared to the real world conditions, and then also kind of go through some of our high level conclusions and recommendations. All right, so I'm Phil Koulis. I'm with SRF Consulting. I roughly have six years of traffic engineering experience, and throughout that time, I focus on multimodal operations, so your pet bikes, transit. Uh, a lot with signal operations and then doing corridor studies. So I'm in some quite a bit. And as I mentioned, I'm Justin Stevens. Uh, same, about six years of experience in the traffic engineering world. Uh, done a lot of focus on multimodal micro simulation, corridor studies, um, basically just modeling heads, buses, BRTs, LRTs, everything under the sun. All right, so we have some overview of what the project was and the different stages of the project. So we'll be talking about the soccer stadium that was just recently constructed and opened up this year. So Minnesota United, they entered the league in 2017, but for the past couple of years, they've been playing at the uh, Minnesota Gopher Stadium. But this April, they opened up their own stadium. There's a rendering of it. We'll show a real photo later. Um, so now they're playing in their own stadium and the stadium seats roughly 20,000 people. And there are um, provisions to expand to 25,000 people by 2040 if they need to for additional capacity. And essentially, the games are continually sold out and they feel if there's demand, they can increase that. In addition to the stadium, uh, residential, office, retail on the site as well, that has not currently been constructed, but there are plans to construct that in the future. So right now, it's just the soccer stadium on the site with the uh, existing retail that's on there as well. And this site has a transit and multimodal focus. So there's very limited parking on site. There's less than 500 spots on site. So we really were focusing on how to get people to the site via walking, uh, taking bikes, transit. So that was the main focus. So there were two stages to this project. There was the initial planning for the stadium. And then we moved into the event management. So basically a pedestrian control plan, how we were getting pedestrians from the stadium to their various modes of transportation. So we presented on this before, and that was mainly on the planning for the stadium. This presentation will focus more on the actual event management and then the comparison of operations in the field to what we saw in the model. So the stadium is located between Minneapolis and St. Paul. So these are the two major cities in the Twin Cities. So it's pretty centrally located between them. There's LRT running along the corridor as well, so that was an advantage because the site is roughly 36 acres, so there's a lot of room for development on the site in addition to the stadium, so this is a pretty high traffic generator, and it's immediately adjacent to I-94, so that's the interstate between the two cities, so as you can imagine, it carries a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of desire to go between the cities, and then it's adjacent to Snelling Avenue, which we'll talk about in more detail, but that corridor also carries a lot of traffic, so I mean, the site was pretty unique in its proximity to the interstate, the LRT that's right there. Um, so there was a lot to take into account as we were working through this project. All right, so there were two parts of the study. There was looking at the mixed use development. So this was for all the housing retail office, and this was just looking at your AM, PM, your peak hours. So the typical traffic that occurs during those so that was just more your standard traffic analysis, not as exciting as the actual soccer stadium. So for the soccer stadium, we were looking at managing of traffic for the event. So there's 20,000 pedestrians on the site. How are we getting them from the stadium back to their home? So through all the modes of transportation, so shuttle buses, LRT, BRT, uh, standard buses that were in the area, walking, biking, and then for the select few that get to park on site, uh, getting them to their cars and off-site as well. So as part of this, we're looking at trip distribution. How is everyone getting to the site? Where are they coming from? Minneapolis, St. Paul, the adjacent neighborhoods around there. 
we are looking at planning of the area to store pedestrians. So with all those pedestrians, we need to be able to safely store them um, in the various areas for the LRT shuttles. So we were planning on how much space was needed. We were looking at multimodal needs. So part of this, due to the limited parking that's on site, we were having to figure out how to get everyone to the site. So we were assuming LRT would be maxed out, BRTs would be maxed out, but that still was short of the 20,000 people. So as part of that, a shuttle service would be needed. So we were looking at basically the frequency that shuttles would need to run to accommodate all the people that needed to use them and get to offsite parking. And then one last metric that was also looked at was the departure duration. So this is basically once the game lets out, how long does it take everyone to get off site? So this was a metric that Metro Transit was wanting to understand. So the operating agency of the BRT, LRT, so basically all public transportation here, and then also the city of St. Paul. So the same is located in the city of St. Paul. So they were curious to know how long it would take for everyone to get off site as well. Let's kind of go through some of the base assumptions. So our model needs. Um, one of the big things that we needed to understand was uh, how PEDs were going to route out of the stadium and get to the respective multimodal components. So as Phil mentioned, uh, the light rail, which runs east-west on the north side of the stadium, the bus rapid transit line, which runs north-south on the west side of the stadium, and then the shuttle service that was taking folks from the stadium to the off-site parking and, and um, back. Uh, the, we wanted to kind of understand the shuttle needs. Uh, that area is fairly constrained in the southeast quadrants of the stadium. And so kind of wanted to know how, how much space we needed, how many buses they needed, how long it was going to take for that area to, uh, to clear out. And then as Phil mentioned, the departure duration um, we needed to take a high level stab at how we thought the PEDs were going to leave the stadium. Uh, and we broke that down in 15 minute bins and we'll get to that later on in the presentation. Uh, also the locations for the traffic control officers, uh, state or city of St. Paul police had multiple officers stationed around the stadium, both pre and post game to help manage where PEDs were supposed to go, help manage traffic, make sure uh, that both PEDs and vehicles and bikes were all um, kind of working together and uh, making sure that nobody got hurt uh, after the game. So what you'll see here is a very high level look around the stadium. So the orange in kind of the top left is the project location and the circles that you're seeing around the stadium are and in the surrounding areas are uh, kind of those major corridor, those major intersections that we looked at um, around the stadium. In total, we looked at eight signalized intersections. Uh, there were nine unsignalized intersections. There were 11 transit slash shuttle routes in the area, and um, we had about a 10 minute headway with our uh, light rail transit and our bus rapid transit headways. Uh, and then we had approximately 15,000 of the 20,000 depart in the 30 minutes after the event was um, was let out. And so we utilized, as part of this, um, we had to utilize the, the VizWalk 10,000 pedestrian add-on um, just because at that at any moment in time we were going to exceed the stock default um, max number of PEDs. Uh, and as you can see on here, I mentioned the green line that runs east-west along the north side of the stadium, and then the blue line, which is the A-line BRT, which run or ran along the west side of the stadium. As part of our modeling, we use the Fruin 1 pedestrian speed distribution. So this is, is the stock distribution that uh, assumes an average of three and a half feet per second for our pedestrian walking speeds. So we wanted to be consistent with what some of the default were, uh, defaults were and also kind of consistent with what is assumed in general studies, whether they be traffic studies or event studies such as this one. To kind of help us uh, understand where PEDs were going and to get some of the metrics that we wanted to compare back to the model, we set up uh, video cameras essentially mounted on poles at different areas around the stadium. We had approximately 10 cameras total uh, that were set up during the pre and post game periods. And so we collected data for essentially a, a couple hours before the game, 
uh, during the game and then a few hours after the game as well. And as I mentioned, we had these located at all of the major pedestrian crossings around the stadium so that we could really get an idea of how things were working and, uh, and get all that information that we needed to compare back to the model. As Phil mentioned earlier, our main focus for this uh, project was the Snelling Avenue crossing. It was the highest utilized crossing around the stadium. Uh, it had both pedestrians who were going to the westbound LRT stations as well as both the northbound and southbound uh, BRT stations. This was um, by far the largest crossing and the most, um, the most heavily utilized. Uh, so this is just kind of a screenshot of the video in the top left corner of where our camera was located and kind of the view that we had from it. So we utilized um, a cloud-based counting service to essentially count um, our pedestrian crossing on the top of the screen, or on the top of the screenshots. So that's basically we had them count everything from the fence line to what would be the west or the right in the, in the camera field as well as kind of looking at how pedestrians dispersed once they got across uh, the crosswalk. And as you can see, it's located in the northwest quadrant. And uh, this is an, an updated aerial of the site uh, as of opening day of the game. So you can see that the rendering that we showed early on um, looks significantly different. Um, but overall, that's kind of the, the vision of the site. Yeah, and one thing to take note of here, Justin mentioned it, is this was the highest crossing. This was also the highest bottleneck. And because basically this crossing is for the westbound LRT that's located up here. So anyone that wants to use that LRT has to cross Snelling Avenue, which that also carries a lot of, a lot of vehicles just due to general purpose traffic. But then also a lot of Ubers and Lyfts that are out in the area. So those two movements were in uh, conflict with each other. So this crossing was pretty much the linchpin of the whole operations after the game of getting everyone off the site. And so what we wanted to compare as part of this uh, was the walking speed for the pedestrians, um, both when they're at free flow and when they're in queue as well, to get an understanding of how our assumption of three and a half feet per second compared to uh, the real world conditions, uh, the distribution of PEDs actually leaving the event, as well as the total number of pedestrians utilizing the Snelling Avenue crossing, and then the density of pedestrians in our various queuing areas around the stadium. So those queuing areas were uh, for the LRT platforms, the BRT platforms, and also uh, the, the area to the east of Snelling Avenue uh, where PEDS were queued waiting to cross um, to get over to those LRT, BRT areas. All right, so I'm going to talk about the first metric that we compared between the VISA model and then the actual field observations. So this is one of the metrics that you can use as you're calibrating your model and you're trying to uh, model pedestrians is basically the walking speed. So similar to entering speed limits in VSIM, this is a key parameter when you're modeling pedestrians. So we have used the through in one, so that's the three and a half feet per second in the model. Um, so you can see that on the graph there, that's on the left. And then we took three different measurements in the field of that crossing. So we were looking at the front of the pack, so that's the first few people to leave the um, crosswalk and then start departing. So these are the people you'd expect to have the highest uh, speed because essentially they're free flow, there's nobody in front of them slowing them down. So that was 4.6 feet per second. So greater than one, feet, one foot per second faster than what was coded into the model, which is something you probably would expect as, I mean, people are leaving an event, they're generally in a rush, they want to beat everyone else that's around them to the various modes of transportation, so they're the first ones to get on the train, so they don't have to wait forever. Um, so we definitely saw a higher walking speed in real life than what we had in the model. And then we also were looking at the middle of the pack, so basically the people in the middle of the queue as they're crossing Snelling Avenue, and looked at the back of the pack. So these are the stragglers that just made it across before the police officers shut them off. So these are down in the 3.3 and 3.5 feet per second. So this is closer to what we had entered in the model, but these speeds are slower more so due to the congestion that's ahead of them. So they would, would fan out and then start to pinch back in at the fence. So these were walking slower due to congestion and their free flow speed would, would likely be higher. So this is something that we'll keep in mind moving forward is now that we actually have field data after an event, 
that peds definitely are walking faster after an event than the standard 3.5 feet per second. Um, so this is data that could be used after an event in more of a scenario where people are rushed that this would make sense to increase the walking speed. The next metric we looked at was the distribution of pedestrians leaving the event. So basically, what is the profile after the game lets out of people leaving? So there's the first 15 minutes here. So this is basically before the uh, before the game's complete. So assuming it's a close game, most people are going to be waiting till the end. You're not having a 4-1 blowout where everyone leaves with 20 minutes left to get out of there. So this is assuming a close game at the end. So in the Visa model, we had 5% leaving before the game let out, 50% immediately after, 40% percent the time period after that down to five so it was a pretty sharp profile so that's the red lines and then in the field so the green we were pretty close on the initial departure so before the game let out we're at eight percent but then it took people longer to reach the crossing longer to get there than what we had planned for and this was more so attributed to how long it takes for people to get out of the stadium so we didn't model individual pedestrians leaving their seats we modeled them leaving the, the stadium, and we had the doors coded in so that everyone had to funnel through doors on the stadium, but we didn't account for how long it took for people to actually walk from their seat down through all of the um, concourse areas down to actually where they can exit the stadium. And then you can see on the end there, there's down to 5 and 3%, so we're pretty close there. So basically, the, the middle flipped, basically. The model had it loading quicker, but then less, and... So essentially those two middle time periods were flipped, which is okay. I mean, that basically just flipped the order. I mean, queuing wasn't really impacted by this. It was just the, what which happened first. But it's just something that we found interesting of the profile of people being able to exit the stadium. So kind of the next metric um, that we wanted to look at and kid focusing in on that Snelling Avenue crossing is just the total number of PEDs that, uh, essentially made the crossing or went through the crossing over the course of the peak hour after the after the game, as well as roughly how many pedestrians we were getting across uh, at one instance when we were allowing them to cross. Uh, so things that we kind of took into account with, uh, with this, as you can see in the screenshot, this is the actual model, uh, screenshot from the model, and we coded in the fence and we coded in the, uh, the crosswalk to be the exact width of what we anticipated people to use. Uh, this was this was bracketed by that fence location. Uh, you can't see it in the photo, uh, but right in the middle where the fence is at, there's a column in there, and that column was coded in uh, to make sure that we were modeling the correct effective pedestrian area um, through this through this section. There was a column there in real life and reality to to lock the gate. So we wanted to make sure that we took that into account. So what we're seeing uh, for the field is we had about 3,300 pedestrians that crossed within that peak hour after the game. And at any given time for those crossings, um, we had about 230 to 275 PEDs getting through or utilizing that crossing uh, when the cops allowed them to, to cross. Uh, the VSIM model, uh, we were seeing lower numbers on both factors. Uh, we only had about 2,200 to 2,300 PEDs crossing within that peak hour and only about 200 to 250 on average. Uh, so some of the things that we, uh, we, we kind of attributed to this difference, uh, well, the first one would be our walking speeds. So as Phil mentioned earlier, uh, we were showing much higher walking speeds at the front of the pack and then kind of back to our standard three and a half that we would have assumed. Um, so in the model, we did not pull uh, exact walking speeds for the same front, middle and back, but if your fastest speeds were around the three and a half time, three and a half feet per second range, then you can imagine that in the middle of the back of the pack, folks were walking significantly slower due to the queuing and due to the friction and the density of PEDs utilizing this crossing. Another factor that we had on this, so this crossing was controlled by, it was officer controlled um, during the games. And in our model, we had assumed it was being controlled by the signal uh, to the north, which was sailing in university. So in our model, we were very, uh, it was very strict, right? It was very rigid in terms of how long we would have for a crossing. 
Uh, whereas in reality, in the field, the officers, with them being the ones who are controlling it, they were operating it as allowing folks to walk when east-west university was green, and then they were starting to shut it down when the east-west left turns started making their movements. And the reason being is, is this allowed us to get all of the peds across the road, or most of them across the road, uh, before the north and southbound traffic on Snelling needed to needed to take needed to go, uh, and this was done just to maintain our platooning and maintain our coordination along Snelling. Because as Phil mentioned, uh, this was this is the heaviest traveled roadway around the stadium outside of the interstate, uh, so the heaviest traveled arterial, and we wanted to make sure we were maintaining our progression along Snelling. What you're seeing here is the the model or the, sorry, the field outputs of, uh, or the model outputs, sorry, of um, basically every five minutes, uh, starting from the initial, the first part of the simulation running through the end. Um, so the match got out roughly 15 minutes after the start of the simulation, and we start to see those volumes ramp up to the middle of the time, to the middle of the, uh, of the simulation. And then we have our actual clear time around 3,600 seconds, and our model clear time around 4,200 seconds. So what that means, in the field, we cleared the crossing in roughly about 45 minutes after the game let out. And then in VSIM, it took about 60 minutes to clear, so about 15 minutes longer. So they were relatively close. Uh, but again, most of this is attributed to uh, the change in walking speeds, as well as we had pedestrians funneled down or corralled significantly more in the VSIM model uh, than, than what they corralled uh, on the actual game day. So they were allowed to kind of spread out, and then um, so we were, we were storing more PEDs um, right there at the side of the road. So they just were able to get, we were getting more people across in any given crossing. All right, so the last metric that we looked at was the density of pedestrians when queuing. So basically how close is everyone standing together when they're waiting for to cross the road, waiting for the LRT, waiting for their shuttle. So as you can imagine, people are standing pretty densely after a game. Everyone's trying to rush to get out. So one area we were looking at in particular was the LRT platform. So basically the storage area as people are waiting to board the LRTs. So Metro Transit, the operating agency, they told us that you can roughly store um, a full train on the platform, which is roughly 600 people for a full train. So that's what they said you could store on there. In the Visa model, we were having roughly 420 PEDs store on the platform. And then in the field, we were observing roughly about 500 PEDs. So we were somewhere in between what Metro Transit had told us that they could store and what we had in the Visa model. Um, so another metric we were looking at was basically how long it took to load the LRTs and get out of the stations. So in the Visa model, we were having four to five minutes roughly. So this is all, this accounts for all the time it takes for the people on the platform to get on the train and then the stragglers to come in and fill it in. So basically what's happening is the platform clears, they load on the train, and then we have people straggling across the tracks to then load the train. So they're loading at a slower rate because they're having to then walk to the train. The same phenomenon occurred in the uh, field as well, just to a lesser extent. So in the field, we roughly had people loading the train. So the platform was clearing out in 60 seconds. And then there was about two minutes where people were uh, straggling in to then get on the train. So in real world, the trains were loaded in three minutes compared to the model of four to five, which is attributed to the platform holding more people than we had in the model. And then also the pedestrians walking at a faster speed. So as they're filtering in after the platform clears, they're able to walk in faster and get on the train faster. So that's why we were seeing the uh, train load times in the field be lower than what they actually were in the visa model. So moving forward, I think this was using the standard waiting area um, design, the standard waiting area um, parameter for behavior types in VSIM. I think moving forward, we would increase the density that pedestrians will queue for a waiting area and to more more replicate what's actually occurring in the field. So some of the key takeaways and parameters that can be used when calibrating VSIM or VizWalk to actually match an after or post game event or really anything where pedestrians are in more of a hurry, they're willing to 
operate at lower levels of service or will it stand more tightly packed. Um, some of the things we would take away and recommend would be increasing the walking speed that um, pedestrians are walking through the model at, at least the assumed the assumed walking speed, so the walking speed that you code into the model, assuming something higher than the 3.5 feet per second. So we measured 4.6. I mean, moving forward, that's probably roughly what we would we would use based on all the field data we collected and the confidence we have in that number. Um, basically, you should account for how long it takes people to actually exit an event as well, exit where they are seating to get out of the stadium. Um, so it takes people a long time as they're having to work through the concourse areas, wait for all the various rows of seating to clear ahead of them. And then the, the crossing times across that were, um, we were able to get more pedestrians across the main Snelling Avenue crossing in the field than what we observed in the model, which this is attributed to the higher walking speeds. And then also just the nature of how the crosswalk officers or the crossing officers were operating compared to the signal. So this isn't something you can necessarily um, account for in the model as much, but just something to be aware of that things might not be operated in the same way in the field as in the model. So police officers have a lot more flexibility as to how they're going to operate something than what we can code in the model always. So just something to keep in mind. And then pedestrians we observed were willing to store much more densely, much more tightly packed sardines than what we had in the model originally. So that's something we would also recommend increasing is the density that pedestrians are willing to stand at, both for waiting for crossings, waiting for the various modes of public transportation. So we collected lots of data after the, the game through all the different crossings and video processing. So it's interesting to see these results and how they compare compared back to the, the VISA model. I mean, there's generally a lot of information on how cars operate, how vehicles operate out there, so your max flow, speeds of them. But there's a lot less information out there on the behavior of pedestrians and how they behave, and even less so after an event, how, they're, how they behave, what, what they're willing to accept in terms of space that pedestrians want, and then the walking speeds that they're walking throughout the network at. So we didn't have a lot to go off of when we were originally doing the model, but Moving forward, we definitely have a lot more data that we're able to incorporate into pedestrian models. So we found this pretty interesting and hope it was equally as beneficial for everyone tuning in and listening. All right. Thank you guys very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, we'll go ahead and do a quick uh, question and answer session. Uh, so if you have any questions for Phil and Justin, please go ahead and enter them in the questions box. Um, so just to kind of start out, uh, now that you've you've gone through this, you've collected the real world, world data. Is, is there plans to like do a recalibration and use this for uh, for future events or to make cha operational changes uh, in the future? Yeah. So um, right now we're not slated, at least at this location, to be using the model for anything. Now it's more just into an operation standpoint. So it's more so on the officers out there to be um, doing this type of event. But we definitely have other projects where we're looking at pedestrians and large scale events like that. So we'll definitely carry this information forward into our models now that we have some more local refined data as to how pedestrians are behaving. So yeah, our plan is to create different uh, walking speed distributions and also different um, weight be or, uh, pedestrian behaviors so they're able to stand more tightly packed in areas um, for this type of event. So we're definitely planning on using this information moving forward. Okay, great. Um, the next question uh, was about how the uh, average walking speed was measured. Um, I know you mentioned the, the the video collection. Was that an automatic output from them? Uh, no, that actually it wasn't an automatic output. So what we did uh, is we went back and watched the video and essentially picked two points within the video and uh, and timed the timed how long it took a ped to walk from point A to point B, and then back calculated the speed from there. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not an exact science, uh, but it's as close as we could get with the data that we had available. Yes, yeah, so we basically picked two fixed points, and we know real world what that distance is, say 80 feet, and then we were able to see how long it took pedestrians to get from uh, point A to point B. So we thought this was actually a better metric than 
measuring individual walking speeds and basically taking snapshots in time of what they're walking at because this would account more so for the overall distance that they were walking at so it would take into account some more variation so obviously there could be spikes where they're walking faster or a little slower but when you're entering values into a model you're entering one number so we wanted to have confidence that the number we were having and pulling and calculating was basically the average for those various people Okay. A uh, couple questions came in regarding uh, the fact that the pedestrians at the back of the packs are walking faster than the middle of packs. Um, is that just attributed to uh, the, the lower density or, or they have more space yeah. than the, the people yeah, in the so, densest part? Yeah, no, that's essentially it. That, so the middle of the pack was pretty much the most densely packed area. Um, so pedestrians were fanning out and then they were having to squeeze back in to fit through the fence. So you had some people trying to jump the gun and get around people. So they were fanning out, but then ultimately everyone had to go through the fence. So the middle of the pack area was the most densely packed area. But then the stragglers towards the end, the density had thinned out and they were able to walk a little bit faster than the people that were in the heart of the crossing. Um, so yeah, but it definitely was attributed to basically how much space the pedestrians had towards the back. That was a very interesting um, comparison just from a high level standpoint as we were looking at uh, how the operations were occurring out in the field versus what we had coded in the model. We had that very distinct you know, width in the model, um, but in reality, as Phil said, people try to jump the gun and then realize, oh my gosh, we all got to go through the same, the same gap. There's no way to kind of get around. So it essentially, there were kind of two bottlenecks. You had people f waiting to cross so the neck them down, then they'd fan out a little bit, then have to get necked back down. And so that's kind of why we were seeing that that slower walking speed in the middle. Okay. Uh, one other question here um, was if there was any consideration uh, given to accessibility when people may have, you know, slower walking speeds or, or paths for those people. Um, was that considered at all? Um, so less so in the model, we didn't model like slow, super slow pets, but in real life there, there were accommodations for um, ADA and people that uh, weren't able to walk as far. So basically this assume, this event plan assumed people were having to walk quite a ways around buildings to get to various uh, crossings of the LRT. But in real, in the field they were, if you had a need to um, board elsewhere. I mean, all the ramps were ADA accessible and then you could cross actually at the Snelling University Avenue intersection. So that is typically where pedestrians cross for a non-event condition. But for the event, we weren't wanting people to cross there due to the limited storage at that crossing. There's a lot of traffic going through that intersection. So for pedestrian safety, we were directing people outside of that intersection. And unless you had um, an accessibility need, you weren't allowed to go to that crossing. So yes, in the field there were um, measures taken to allow everyone to cross and get to the train as needed. Okay, and uh, one more question. Uh, did you model any kind of uh, curbside operations in this for like an Uber and Lyft per se, or was there, was there a dedicated pickup area for that type of operation, or uh, yeah. how did you handle that? Yep, there was. So. Um, the shuttle area that we had mentioned, it was kind of the southeast corner of the, the stadium, um, just essentially on the south side of that. So the direct south edge of the stadium, there was an Uber lift area where we did assume um, a certain number of pedestrians that would utilize that service. And then we had also coded in um, the Uber lifts as PT lines so that we could model that pickup and drop off area as we would see it operating in the, in the field. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't operate quite as planned. Um, they were there was a decent amount of Uber lifts that were utilizing that area. So, uh, but there were quite a few that that dropped off at various locations around the stadium as well. Um, but we did take into account those curbside operations. Okay. All right. Um, I think with that, we are going to go ahead and, and wrap up the session for today. Um, Thank you, Phil and Justin, very much for, for agreeing to present today. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to be putting recording of this up. Uh, it'll be go out in the follow-up email tomorrow and it'll be accessible at the ptvtraffic.us webpage under the resources tab. Also, 
we have our next session is coming up on June 27th, um, again at noon Eastern. Uh, we will have Paul Spears from PTV uh, to highlight his work on the Oslo study, which look into the impact of autonomous vehicles uh, and shared mobility may have on the Oslo region. Uh, there will be a link to register for that that goes out on the follow-up email, so please look for that and make sure to register. All right, so thank you everybody for attending today. Um, there's a couple questions that are coming here at the end. If we don't get a chance to answer them, uh, I'll, I'll send those out to Phil and Justin so they can we can get that followed up. All right, thank you very much, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.